I'll be talking about a topic that is called learning to walk and walking to learn. What does this topic mean? It sounds very rhythmic, like a poem, learning to walk, walking to learn. So what my presentation today is about, it's about nature versus nurture. Is that true? Or it's nature and nurture both working for your good. And the second topic is why Forrest Gump was able to finish that marathon across the America so efficiently. In short, I'll be talking about the efficiency of the gate and how you can improve uh, your efficiency of walking. So before I begin my presentation uh, and I, I this talk, I would like to show you this interesting image. And this is not an uh, image that is Odo, uh, Adobe Photoshopped. This is a real image of Mike the Headless Chicken. One day, Mike's owner decided to have him served on the plate. But little that everybody knows of that he made, he became a center of attraction in Colorado. And that center of attraction is basically a very interesting case model in the field of motor neuroscience. And you can clearly see over here that a good part of cortex region of Mike is removed due to that incident, but Mike was still able to walk. And he walked on this earth for the next two years. And he didn't die of starvation. He died of overfeeding. <laughs> so one thing that a lot of motor neuroscientists are interested in is why Mike the Headless Chicken was able to walk for the next two years of his life without a head. And they came up with this idea that there are some pre-existing circuits in the central nervous system that are hardwired into us and even in the absence of cortex, we are, can still, like those animals, like Mike, are still able to execute basic rhythmic movement pattern. And these circuits are called central pattern generators. And they came up with this theory that you don't need any cortex input from the top of your head, and sometimes you don't even need sensory input. These circuits are basically central circuits, and they can operate of their own. In simple terms, if I have to say, you don't need to think when you walk. <laughs> Especially at this time of your life. Of course, when you were a toddler, when you, when you were go growing up, you used to think a lot when you're walking because you're stabilizing your posture. But when you are all fully grown adult, you just go with the flow. You walk so well. And this is what Mike the Headless Chicken had done for the rest of his life. Using a good amount of brainstem region and the spinal cord, he was still able to generate rhythmic movement patterns. So next slide, I'll show you an interesting theory which I have spent several years working on. It's called muscle synergy theory. And I'm not the originator of this theory. I just utilize this theory to understand or reverse engineer human movement so that we can design prosthesis, we can help understand spinal cord injury-related issues, we can also improve the performance of athletes. And in this theory, you can see in this diagram, it looks pretty much a complicated diagram, but if you see clearly over here, I will just explain it as these W1, W1, 2, 3, these are pretty much like building blocks of movement. And this theory is sometimes associated with building blocks of movement, pretty much like Lego building blocks. When you use those Lego building blocks, you combine them, you form different structures. But you're using the same building blocks to form different structures. Similarly, when you're cutting something in the, in the kitchen with a knife, you're flexing and extending your arm. The same movement you do when you're lifting weight in the gym or even when you're performing a smash shot when you're playing any sports that you love to play, especially in tennis. A little bit of flexion and extension. So you're using a very basic model of the movement, but you're assembling those movement patterns, these building blocks in different way to form different movements. Just like you assemble those Lego building blocks, the same Lego building blocks to form different movements. So I spent several years of my life in understanding these basic building blocks of movement. And how exactly we, I have done that? Well, a lot of researchers, what they do, they usually acquire the electrical activity of the muscles and then use some computational algorithms to decode those kind of a building blocks. Because if we reverse engineer those building blocks, we will be able to solve some of the complex problem in the field of motor neuroscience, biomechanics, kinesiology, and some other areas of biomedical sciences. 
Let me show you something else over here. There's a research group. They did a study on neonates, preschoolers, toddlers, and adults. And what they did, they tried to understand what changes happens in those building blocks, in those muscle coordination pattern when somebody is growing up. And what they found out, that, they, that, that there are two muscle coordination groups, especially this one over here and this one, they stayed pretty much consistent for the most of the life. But as you grow up further and further, as you reach an adulthood, you add two more muscle coordination pattern into that. And once you add these two new muscle coordination pattern on top of that, you kind of preserve them. You kind of hardwire them also. So it means that these first two coordination patterns, or the muscle coordination pattern you have, they are pretty much like primitive in nature, pretty much hardwired into your central nervous system. And those new that you're adding over here, they're basically the learned motor or muscle coordination pattern. So you're not nature against nurture. You're not nature versus nurture. It's nature and nurture together working for your good. You have a primitive motor behavior or a hardwired motor behavior, and you're adding something new on top of that so that you can walk with a nice flow, with a more efficient uh, gait pattern, with a more efficient walking pattern. Well, this is someone else's research. Why I'm talking about it? Guess what? I have my own research, too. So here is the model that I use to understand uh, those muscle coordination patterns. Can we? Uh, really see there's a kind of a modification on those muscle coordination pattern. So what I did, I used this experimental design. I put a human being on the ground and put the same human being on the slack line. It's a very deviating, perturbing platform. So when you walk, you kind of stabilize your posture. And it's a very complicated task. And I want to see what happens to those existing, robust, consistent muscle coordination pattern. Will they stay same or will they change? And I acquired the electrical activity of the muscles, and then I applied some computational uh, algorithms, and I spent the next four years of my dissertation in doing this work. And this is what I found. In the red bar, you can see this is the muscle coordination pattern when somebody is stabilizing his posture on that deviating platform. And in the blue one, you can see that the person is actually walking. The amount of muscle coordination pattern across these individuals is more consistent compared to the time when they're stabilizing your posture. What does that exactly mean? It means when I am going to walk on the ground, an XYZ person is going to walk on the ground, our muscle coordination pattern is going to be very consistent because we are actually having a lot of similarity in our primitive motor behavior. But when we are on this challenging platform on this challenging task, we form new muscle coordination pattern. That's why the consistency decreased. In simple terms, if I have to say that, it's the sensory information that makes us different. It's how we feel about things that makes us different, a more on the philosophical note. And this figure gives you a better idea, because over here with this uh, red line going at the back, it's showing the sensory information being fed into, uh, into, a, into someone, into a human being or into an animal. So it's showing that when the sensory information is fed back to your body, what happens? And in this one, the blue is showing when the sensory information is fed back during the walking task. You can see during the walking task and during the slacklining task, the quality of the sensory information is very different. Because when you're stabilizing your posture, it's very complicated. It's very different. You never experienced it. You do not know how to handle it. All you're doing is moving your hips, moving your shoulders, a lot of sensory information. And this abundant and sensory information, different sensory information, result in this kind of electrical activity of the muscles. You can clearly see the rhythm over here is quite clear but on this area, the rhythm is very erratic, which means when you're on slack line, the rhythm that you produce with your muscle is not as clean or is not as consistent as when you're walking on a ground. And this rhythm stays consistent between you and me. We are so much alike and so much different. 
Let's take a look at some other fun thing I did during my thesis. Because I like experimenting, experimenting with people. And uh, I made things a little challenging for them. And of course, they gave me their consent form when I was selecting the data. So, <laughs> and I did, with their consent, made things a little challenging for them. So what I did, I trained these individuals. And once I trained them, they were feeling very happy about themselves. And now I put them against elite slackliners who had been doing this task for at least seven to eight years. And what you're seeing over here is a summary of one of my paper. And this summary is telling us something exciting, that all these three, four blocks that you're seeing, they are basically the building blocks that I was talking about. So when a highly proficient slackliner is walking, he's having more building blocks of movement combination. When somebody who is not that proficient, he's only, only having only three building blocks combining together to help him stabilize the posture. What's that, that additional fourth block helping over here? What that additional new learning behavior is helping this person that the moderately proficient slackliner is not able to do? It is helping with the higher knee flexion. And that's what we have uh, studied, that when somebody who is an elite slackliner, who is a proficient slackliner, when he's going to walk on this deviating platform, there's one new thing that he will do, which our moderately proficient, moderately proficient slackliners was not able to do. It means they weren't bending their knee enough. And when you bend your knee enough, you're kind of taking your center of mass downward, a little bit more downward, so you can be more stable. And that's one, another strategy elite slackliners use, which of our moderately proficient slackliners has not learned. But the other behavior is quite primitive, quite consistent, quite hardwired. Flexion, extension of the knee, foot propulsion, we all use that. So what does this, these slides are telling us? Is nature against nurture? Well, not really. Nature and nurture, they both work together for your good. As a Christian, I believe God works for your good. He makes things work together for your good. So nature and nurture, they both exist in this universe. They work for your good. And now let's move to Forrest Gump over here. <laughs> this is a, a new study that I'm doing at Northwestern College, and we're collecting some data. So this is a preliminary data. And in this data, what you can see over here is a graph that is telling about great efficiency over here. So we are collecting some data about oxygen consumption, oxygen uptake, and car carbon dioxide release. And what we found out over here, that when you are walking at an average walking speed, you are more efficient. So people who are thinking about uh, a competitive runner, I would rather suggest you walk, walk an, at an average walking speed. In that way, you will be able to finish the race. Probably might not be able to win it, but still finish it more efficiently. And people who think walking slow will help them, well, not truly, because walking slower is also inefficient. And of course, walking faster is also inefficient. And what happens in this phase is the amount of the electrical activity of your muscle, especially the frequency of the electrical activity of your muscle, also changes. And we have seen some trade-off between the front of your leg and the back of your leg. And I call the front of these leg as tibialis anterior, more in the science nerdy way. And guess whose name is, especially the back of the leg muscle, lower leg muscle. So there's a trade-off between the front and the back of the lower leg muscles when you're transitioning from a slower speed to a faster speed. The strength of the contraction completely changes. Where's Forrest Gump over here? He's over here. So I was watching this movie two days ago on YouTube, uh, some scenes, and I just realized that Forrest Gump wasn't actually walking faster. He was actually running. And you can see that over here. If you start running from this point to this point, you are actually becoming more efficient when it, when, when it comes to you know, locomotion. So walking at a faster speed and running at, at a faster speed, you can clearly see running at a faster speed is more efficient. 
One of my colleagues told me when I was doing this rehearsal, he told me he would rather run on an airport than walk faster because he gets so much uh, shin splits. I said, well, there you go. That's the answer. So next time, if you decide to be walking more efficiently, I would say run rather than walk faster. That's the conclusion of this slide. I hope you enjoyed it. And that's what is all about walking and efficient locomotion, learning to walk, walking to learn. In short, nature and nurture are not against each other. Nature and nurture both work for your good. And secondly, uh, in order to be more efficient, you have to walk, well, not walk, you have to run faster rather than walk faster. And again, there's a, there's a, there's a, per, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's something different over here that I would like to present. Running is very subjective. Maybe running at six miles per hour is faster for me. Maybe it might not be as faster for you, or maybe a little bit more faster for you. So it can also be subjective. If you have any questions, I'm all here to hear outside this room. And thank you, and have a nice day.